Hi everybody and welcome to A Case of the Jills. Okay, gonna get comfortable, this one's gonna be a ride. If you're new here, I'm happy to see you. My name is Jill. I am a researcher in the topic of psychology as it relates to hypothalamic amenorrhea and overtraining syndrome in all genders. I just finished up my thesis on the prevalence and type of psychopathology in ultra endurance athletes and I've got a head full of stuff that I'm really excited to share with you. I'm also a health coach and I do mentoring calls for folks who might need a little help in some of these areas. If you like what you see in this video and want to schedule a mentoring call with me, you can do so. All the information is in the box below. So today's video is inspired by a few clients that I have. They've asked me some really great questions on their long-term consequences of hypothalamic amenorrhea. To be frank with you, there are people who are sort of at the more advanced stages of what we would consider to be our window of fertility. So these are people aged 45 and above. They're not in menopause yet. They might be in perimenopause, but they also don't get a period. They've asked me a lot of questions about whether or not it's worth it. Upon reflection, they are not the only population for whom this might be a lingering question. So this video today attempts to address why should I bother trying to get my period back? So like I said, there's that group that's over 45, let's say. Children are not part of the equation. They may have been at one point um, or maybe never. They are certainly not part of the equation now. Their main goal is not fertility. They're unmotivated to leave behind some of the bad habits that they may have picked up along the way. They may feel as though they need those bad habits or they're just really reliant on them. They may be very comfortable where they are and are really struggling with the idea that why should I give all this up to quote unquote recover something that I may not even have anymore. Another group of people who this may apply to is somebody who is young and absolutely knows that they don't wanna have children. Fertility is just not an issue for them. It may be difficult for that person to stay motivated to get a period every month if they think that the direct outcome from that is just making babies. The third group of people that this may apply to is someone again at any age, but who has prioritized their sport so far and above everything else in their life that they truly think that maintaining that status is worth sacrificing literally everything else. And of course, there is uh, another group of people that this applies to, and that is someone who is potentially non-binary or someone who doesn't identify necessarily as female. So this could be somebody who was born as female with female parts and their body will be making female hormones. However, for this person identifying as female and all the mechanisms that go with that may feel really uncomfortable. They may be preferring to be in a smaller body size and a more androgynous type of body that makes them feel more comfortable just for their identity, for who they are in the world. Menstruation can be an uncomfortable reminder of femininity or of uh, feminization. If that's not what you're interested in, that's gonna be difficult. So in all of these cases, what's really going on here is that there's a lack of information being shared and understood about what it means to be in endocrine dysfunction. When we don't make the hormones necessary to get a period, that's where we are. Our endocrine system is not functioning properly and we are at a serious disadvantage when it comes to health outcomes overall as they apply to things that the endocrine system does. We get the impression that we can choose like choosing to recover is a choice, meaning that we can prioritize things like aesthetics or performance, even things like efficiency, if that's the way you wanna see it. We can prioritize that over our health because eh, I don't really need to get a period. I'm not interested in fertility and eh, whatever, I'll take my chances on the other stuff. When I hear this, Oh God, it makes me really nervous. Of course I understand why people say this. There's not enough information out there that is shared about these really serious long-term health consequences that come when we are out of balance. You're gonna hear me talk for the rest of this video, not just about getting your period back, because yes, that is something that happens, but what I'm really gonna be talking about today is a problem with your endocrine system. We're gonna be talking about endocrine dysfunction. On this channel, we've talked about the long-term health consequences of hypothalamic amenorrhea, but let's just recap, make sure we're all together on the same page. Most of what I'm gonna talk about comes from this paper that I refer to all the time. It's a 2017 paper, and it's called Hypothalamic Amenorrhea and Long-Term Health Consequences. It's by Schufelt, Torbati, and Dutra. Of course, if you want links to any of this stuff, you can just leave a comment below and I'll send it to you. The focus of this paper is estrogen. We're looking at estrogen as it extends to health outcomes, not just fertility. 
This paper is super interesting to me because it specifically calls the women in this category, so hypothalamic amenorrhea and really no motivation to recover, as the quote unquote walking well. Women in this category are premenopausal. They do not feel ill at all. They're really not feeling the ill effects of not getting a period. They're not feeling the effects of being in endocrine dysfunction. So some of the things that may happen is an increase of cardiovascular disease. Let me remind you that pre-COVID cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death for women in the United States. Most important thing you need to know is that estrogen is the superstar. Estrogen mediates inflammation, oxidative stress, and lots of other anatomical changes to the heart that are not favorable to long-term health. Without estrogen, we have an increase of atherosclerosis. We can get all kinds of abnormal blood flows in the heart. The risk of myocardial ischemia goes up and the ability to pump blood goes down. All of this increases your chance of heart attack. And by the way, it doesn't matter how old you are. What matters is you're not making estrogen. Let's talk about some of the bone consequences. I think a lot of you are probably familiar with those things. So the terrible thing about not making enough estrogen is not just that the production of bone is suppressed. It's also that bone deterioration increases. Both of these things, as you already know, lead to osteopenia and osteoporosis. Another interesting little tidbit is because you are in a state of hypothalamic amenorrhea, we know that you have a very high increase in cortisol. Remember, this is all under the umbrella of endocrine dysfunction. Well, high cortisol also impacts bone health. You're gonna have more trouble absorbing vitamin D with a very high level of cortisol. You're gonna have problems with your thyroid hormone, which also helps to regulate bone mineral density. Even calcium absorption is gonna be inhibited because of that high cortisol and so on and so on. I could go into all the health consequences of osteoporosis, but I think you know what they are. Not only are fractures kind of inevitable, but what we're really talking about is a quality of life issue. We can't just think about stress fractures in terms of what they mean to an athlete or to a young person. We have to think about what happens when you get a fracture when you're 60, 70, 80 years old, not when you're 32. It's easy to see how that is going to have a much greater impact on your quality of life. Let's talk about the brain stuff, my favorite topic. When you have a decrease of estrogen, you are also gonna have a decrease of neurotransmitters and neuropeptides. That's serotonin and dopamine. You know, the happy guys. So mood and cognitive ability are gonna be impacted. Every single area of the brain is affected. So you can expect psychiatric symptoms like depression, anxiety, mood disturbances. You can also expect cognitive issues relating to things like memory, spatial ability, neural activity in general. And what's worse, your brain will age quicker without estrogen. We're talking about synaptic decline, dementia, and other cognitive impairments. Because I think this is positively terrifying, I am going to read to you from the study where I pulled a lot of information about the role of estrogen and other sex hormones in brain aging, neuroprotection, and DNA repair. Ooh lordy, this is a bad one. This study is from 2017 and this is Zarate, Stevensner, and Gradilla. Okay, let me just read this to you. Sex hormones, particularly estrogens, possess potent antioxidant properties and play important roles in maintaining normal reproductive and non-reproductive functions. They exert neuroprotective actions and their loss during aging and natural or surgical menopause is associated with mitochondrial dysfunction, neuroinflammation, synaptic decline, cognitive impairment, and increased risk of age-related disorders. Moreover, loss of sex hormones has been suggested to promote an accelerated aging phenotype, eventually leading to the development of brain hypometabolism. Okay, what's very interesting about this study is that it mentions menopause by any means. So that means natural menopause, surgical, or in our population, the case where somebody doesn't make estrogen anymore because they chose not to. And one more part further down on the study. As mentioned above, one factor that is believed to play an important role in the sex differences observed in brain aging and neurodegeneration is sex hormone levels, in particular estrogen. It is well known that estrogen receptors are widely distributed in the brain, having important regulatory function on different processes such as cognition, anxiety, body temperature, feeding, and sexual behavior. And then it goes on to talk about a bunch of different studies that show how decreasing estrogen levels enhance neurodegenerative processes and increase brain damage. I mean, ugh, do you need to hear more than that? I could say I'm not trying to scare you, but I kinda am. I think you can see how we're literally playing with fire here. So I'm hoping that those of you sort of in that younger population who have your reasons for not wanting to get a period will really take this to heart and think about 
all of the years you have ahead of you to get in a place that is out of endocrine dysfunction. Now, for those of you that are at the upper end of that fertility window, don't kid yourself in thinking that it's too late to get the show on the road, cause it's not. Remember that the endocrine system manages kind of everything in the body. So when you are able to get things back online again, you can actually recuperate some of the functionality that you may have lost by not making enough sex hormone. And you know, I talk about the endocrine system a lot and maybe, maybe some people are not really aware of all of the things that are involved in that actual system. We're talking about the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the adrenal glands, thyroid, parathyroid, pineal gland, pancreas, also the ovaries, and if you're a guy, testes. Think about what all of these different glands do and think about all of what they're not doing well because your endocrine system is not functioning properly. Remember that the endocrine system manages everything from metabolism to blood pressure, sleep, sexual function, emotions and mood, growth and development, kind of everything. I don't know about you, but I don't want to slide into menopause with all of those things mismanaged. I could end this video right there, but that would be no fun, would it? We haven't even gotten into the hard science yet. I know some of you kind of need to be scared straight, so let's talk about how this could play out. This is applicable to anyone watching this video, it doesn't matter how old you are, but is of specific importance to those people, again, at the upper end of the fertility window, because it is imperative that they come into energy balance, that is, stop restricting food and stop overusing exercise. It is important that they come into energy balance to get the endocrine system online. So if we don't do that, let's talk about how this can play out. If you watched the interview that I did with Dr. Berga recently on this channel, you will see that she very specifically mentioned having a healthy endocrine system as a key to longevity. Being honest with you, it is such a complex process to explain the whys and wherefores of longevity as it relates to the endocrine system, but I'm going to try to give you a little bit of an overview. I'm going to give you a small snapshot through the window of IGF-1 and growth hormone. In a dramatically simplified explanation, we need these two things to be in balance in order to live a long and healthy life. IGF-1, so that's insulin like growth factor 1, mediates growth hormone. If you have too much growth hormone, you end up with things like cancer. If you don't make enough growth hormone, you have a whole other list of issues. We could expect to have an abnormal lipid profile, premature atherosclerosis, metabolic derangements, increased mortality. Yeah, it's not good. Most important thing we have to know for our population is that people who are underfed are not able to achieve a balance between IGF-1 and growth hormone. We can see this repeated over and over again in the studies. The first study I looked at is called Growth Hormone Releasing Hormone Induced Growth Hormone Response in Hypothalamic Amenorrhea. This study was actually done in PISA, just, just actually that way. And it specifically says that amenorrhea as a result of weight loss is particularly problematic. IGF-1 is not able to mediate growth hormone in that population of females. Again, long-term health consequences are many, some of which are cancer. I looked at three other studies that I was gonna to explain to you, but you know what? I think you get the point. The most important one of all though, I am gonna to talk to you about, and this one is called Hypothalamic Pituitary Gonadal Axis Homeostasis Predicts Longevity. This is by Yonker et al. This study is amazing. It directly connects the fact of maintaining hormonal balance with longevity. So this is another study that looked at women who no longer make estrogen. So again, that's either because they are in hypothalamic amenorrhea, they are in menopause, or they've had a hysterectomy, don't have ovaries anymore, so they're not making estrogen. So the study says right here, the longer the HPG axis is maintained in equilibrium, the longer the organism will live. The longer your ovaries function, the longer you live. And in fact, they even have numbers that they put to this, okay? So if you are out of hormonal balance, you don't make estrogen anymore by age 40, they say that you will have a 39% chance of living to age 90. If you can extend that hormonal functionality to age 55, you have a 53% chance of living to age 90. So that's 39 versus 53%. If that doesn't excite you, I don't know what will. I know you probably don't want to hear any more science. I'll take it back a notch. What I really want to impart to you with this video is the following. You may think that you have a choice in recovery. But based on the science, based on what we know about the endocrine system, based on what we know about the realities of biology, you actually don't have a choice. It's not a choice that I would make. What you're telling yourself is that you are prioritizing either something aesthetic, some sort of conceptual success, so maybe through your sport, 
or something about your self-identity, you're hinging that on your body shape. You're hinging that on those bad habits that you have developed to keep yourself a certain way. And while I understand that for certain people, that may feel like the most important thing you can do. It may feel like your top priority, your full-time job. Lord knows it is a full-time job for many people who watch this channel. But it is absolutely imperative that you ask yourself what you are willing to sacrifice. And I think it's very clear for you to see that fertility for some people is the least thing to worry about. Somebody asked me on Instagram the other day, is it possible for a woman to regain her period after age 40? And I know that I've been around for a while, but I just wanna remind you, I did. I want to remind you that I did not start my recovery journey until I was 40. I also did not get married again until I was 42. And this spring at age 45, I will be graduating from my master's degree. Please don't tell me it's too late. It's never too late. It is obvious that stepping into a place of health means letting go of behaviors that no longer serve us. I understand that this journey is difficult and that's what I'm here for. So if you have questions and want to reach out to me, I encourage you to email me at a case of the jills at gmail.com. Like I said, if you'd like to schedule a mentoring call with me, you can do so via the link below. Please follow me on Instagram. I love to see your comments and thank you for those of you who do say hello. I hope this was helpful today. I truly hope that I answered that question for those of you who asked it. I hope you are having a happy and safe week wherever you are and I will see you again soon. Thanks for watching.